you all can hear me? Thanks for coming out on this rainy day. Um, I'm Jackie Bergen from the English Department, and um, it's my pleasure to introduce professor and poet and critic Orlando Menace tonight. Um, I'm going to give you some facts, and then I'm going to try to give you a little bit about him as a person and poet. So, he has been an associate professor here with tenure since 2007. He's been with us now almost 13 years. Before that, he earned a PhD in creative writing at the University of Illinois, Chicago in 1998. Before that honor, and subsequently, Professor Minnis has been a prolific writer, as I said, as a poet, as a critic, um, translator, editor. He's authored four books of poetry, which are on display right here. Borderlands with the Angels, Rumba Atop the Stones, Furia, and most recently, this year, Fetish, which we are celebrating tonight, and congratulations, Orlando. He's done many translations, most especially Alfonsina's, is that the right way to say it? Thank you. Uh, Storin's selected poems called My Heart Flooded with Water. And he's also edited our own <coughs> anthology, Open Light, Poets from Notre Dame as well as an anthology of Latino writings on the sacred called Renaming Ecstasy. He's currently our director of creative writing program, where he's made numerous contributions, including directing 13 master species in these 13 years. That's a lot of work. Those are the facts that we should all know and celebrate and appreciate. But I want to introduce what I know this a little bit more as a person and as a poet. In our contemporary poetry world, which is frequently characterized by what's called post-human poetry, and some of our best practitioners of that are on our Notre Dame faculty and even in this room, um, Orlando continues squarely in the humanist tradition, if by that, and I mean by that. Poems written about human beings, to human beings, with great attention to sound, oral qualities, and not just the visual text. He claims his poetry is not really political, though I actually would disagree with him there. Um, in some of my favorite remarks from an interview, he wrote, or said, it is true that poetry cannot fill an empty belly that words cannot be sown for harvest or caught in the fisher's net, but poetry can and does provide sustenance to the spirit, if not the body. It is the deep song that gives us hope, that makes us resolute, that binds us in the face of hardship. That last aspect, that binds us in the face of hardship, something like poetry as community, or the word is communion, it is part of why Menace, who will sometimes be what we would call a confessional poet, is also remarkably a wide cultural poet. He is always aware of his Cuban roots, his birth in Peru, and with poems both factual and fictional about those cultures, including the larger Caribbean and South America, as well as here. United States and here, Notre Dame. He can be deeply personal, invoking sympathy, even angst for his Chinese grandmother, who was shamed for being Chinese, or involving the actual feelings and reality of his wife, his son, his daughter. He is not afraid to address matters of faith, specifically Catholic faith. In a poem from Fetish, which I hope you will be reading tonight. He says, faith is deep water that wears away the rocks of reason, washes, silt out, washes out silt of creed, unstable, profligate, resistant to doubt's gravity. This kind of generosity of spirit as a poet is evidenced in his personhood as well, both as a teacher and as a colleague and as a friend. I will conclude with one example before turning it over to him. 
Several years ago, I invited him to one of my classes on contemporary feminist poets, and we were reading Lorna de Cervantes, and I asked him to come and help me teach the class. And he offered a reading uh, to the young white man who asked how I, an intelligent woman, can believe in the race between, uh, in the war between races, and he offered a radically different interpretation than I had. And I was quite sure that I was right. And I was the professor of the class, so I was kind of insisting on my interpretation. Absolutely with patience, with no argumentation, he just kept asking me questions that, if I was right, were not answerable. And if he was right, were eminently obvious. So that I changed my mind without ever having a fight with him, and have subsequently taught that poem from Orlando Menace's perspective ever since, as I just did about three weeks ago, telling that wonderful story. So it is with my real pleasure and gratitude that I introduce you to professor, poet, critic, colleague, Orlando Menace. Well, that is so warm. Um, thank you. Uh, I, I, I do have to say that my, my grandmother, my mother's, mother's mother, was one quarter Chinese. Go I just wanted to you know, make that clear. Although to my mother, that, you know, that seemed to preoccupy her nonetheless. Uh, well, I'm going to begin with uh, poems about Cuba, uh, a nation that uh, I have been preoccupied with for so many years, not because I chose it, but because I was given it here. Obsess about this country. Why? Because you must. Uh, okay, so uh, the first uh, poem that I will be reading um, <clears throat> is uh, called Libros, called Books, and it's about books in Havana. Um, why would I write about books? Well, when I visited Havana the first time, my, uh, my wife's uncle uh, had an extensive um, paperback collection in his house. But because these books were printed on such poor quality paper, they were all coming apart. And um, you know, the, the spines were uh, also uh, coming apart. And, and these books were also being used for other purposes, not just in my uh, my wife's uh, uncle's house, but everywhere in Cuba. You, you find people using books in ways that you would never imagine. And uh, I, I was um, impressed by that. So it's called Libros. Hardbacks are the bricks that prop a sinking feather bed, while rag paper science fiction stows away in a Soviet fridge shorted by blackouts. As novellas sprawl on a sailcloth love seat, hemp-bound histories spiral in corners spackled with lard and sawdust. Termites are mulchers of monographs. Molds colonize the sun-crackled tome. House mice nest in the scrunched tracks of Marx and Engels. During thunderstorms, gusts scatter pages beyond wood windows, beyond iron balconies. Flock of a thousand that flaps over hills, glides past breakwaters, then falls, feathered into pulpy waters. This uh, next poem is um, in, in, it is a cross-cultural kind of poem, cross-religious uh, kind of poem. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in, in cultures and, and religions um, encountering each other or one another, and um, and strange things happen 
because of that. Um, and uh, I uh, and my my I imagined, for instance, um, a guy, a, a Jewish guy, living in Havana during the 1950s, who hates Cuba, hates Havana, hates everything about Cuba, except for tobacco. He loves tobacco. He has a fetish for tobacco. That's his thing. That's what keeps him there. You know. And I'm fascinated by people who are so one. So one-minded, I'm fascinated by people like that. And uh, so uh, Zevi Mendel is really out of my own imagination. There is no Zevi Mendel in the end of so just want you to know. Zevi Mendel, ersatz cantor, self-taught Kabbalist, Re retired tobacconist to Havana's Ashkenazim, Zivi Mendel smokes one last corona before the Sabbath, exhaling toward heaven, strokes a tabby cat nipping green leaves from Vuelta Abajo, pigtails a Maduro festoon a sunny window, Cupid dolls wear cigar band crowns, and atop the cedar humidor, a wind-up gramophone wobbles fewer release. It's 1952, and though he's lived 30 years on Calle Monte, his dead wife, a pale boy, a convert from a cow town in Cienfuegos, one son who married the maid, a cute and salty girl, but Ove, black as coal tar, another who turned communist and calls the synagogue a pet of goats. Old Zivi won't go completely native, mangling Spanish, singing, on the tram, wearing wool instead of linen, assailing the neighbors in Yiddish when they party to guarachas. Old Zivi eats only food canned in the U.S. Kashrut beef, beets, sauerkraut, corned beef, says that Cuban meat is trafe, the fish gets iguatera from red tide, hens peck the swill, even plantains ripen to a deathly fall. But tobacco is the exception, Zivi argues. If first grade, no mosaic, worms or rust, the drying done in barns clean of hogs. Soaked in Seder wine, a plug becomes incense. Pipes dawdle is morning ash. <clears throat> and to prevent the evil eye, an amulet of picadura strung around the neck. Whether one inhales doesn't matter, because smoke, weightless, indigestible, cannot be a defamation to God. How contemplation is not brought on by knowing, but by sucking a breva or a panatella on a day where the puffs dance in the stale air of a sunlit room, one cloud turning like a chariot wheel, and old Zevi in awe as the sparks of dust arc into a tremulous rainbow, shaking up. This uh, next poem is also uh, set in Cuba, and uh, it's inspired by a, a short film that I saw, a short film shot in the uh, 1950s <coughs> of uh, charcoal makers. I'm trying to find the, um, uh, the charcoal makers in the swamp of Zapata. It's a swamp in the province of Matanzas. And these people have a really hard existence. They're actually pulling old wood from the swamp to make charcoal out of it. Um, and so it's called Abad, the Charcoal Makers, inspired by the short Cuban film in Megan. At sunrise, when moths molt to orchids, and moon frogs sleep in wetland hollows, the peasants emerge from dead embers, walking into daylight like bone marionettes with charcoal skin, loincloths of work. Sun rays knife black water, a gust sides the wild cane, and men mine the muck not gold or agates, 
but fossil wood they pull out bare handed. Heavy stumps that burn for days in earthen mounds their children watch over, tanking holes with black mud, flat stones. If the oven does not overcook good wood to cinder, the men canoe from palm hamlets, sell their charcoal sacks to Don Ramon, swamps patrician, who pays with credit slips that buy wet sugar, hard salt cod, old lard. Don Ramon boasts he can eat three chickens at a sitting, ramrod fists to make good on threats. Pistol packed in his waist, treating the peasants like milking goats. So docile, he thinks, so dumb, when a woman smiles, waves as he glides on his fancy boat. The beaming toddler gives a belly hug when offered some cadaverous tuber to gnaw, something his Spanish hounds would refuse, nor his prized gamecock's peck. The revolution is coming, Don Ramon, stealthy as gunpowder lit by red embers. That day when peasants rise up at dawn, burn down your domains in pitch skies, the ashen flurries like confetti, your daughters drown in the bog, your diamonds, your gold, fleeting as sugar, butter, and charcoal. I will now move on to the, the poem that uh, Jackie mentioned, uh, the one with those lines. Um, and, and this is uh, a very personal poem on that. It has to do with uh, my wife and I wanting to, to have a, a, a child and, and having some difficulty at the beginning. Um, and. Uh, the poem is set in Cuba, in the eastern part of Cuba, where it's very rocky, uh, where the, the, the uh, tobacco is grown. And um, I imagined uh, a Christ on the rock. And this poem is entitled, A Cristo de Piedra, The Stone Christ. A Cristo de Piedra. Valle de Viñales, Cuba, 2002. In this valley where limestone hills jut out like hairy moles over furs of tobacco, a rock-faced Christ sprawls on a skew cross, as if a child had taken loose shirt to etch his fanged mouth, stick legs, twig fingers. I touch gouged eyes that weep candle wax, caress his ogre heart, praying to have a child. Five years of dud pills, junk shots, toxic teas, specialists who insist your wife's plum works, her hours clocked to Clomid, Centertide, HCG, fridge a mosaic of RX's labs, metals, holy cars. I scratch the ground for a sign, a root gnarled like a crucifix, a seashell mary, big leaf scapular, but only dig up a few termites dried to husk. By year's end, we adopt a Panamanian girl, certain that Ibis would not conceive. Around March, she gets fits of heartburn, thinks it's acid reflux, then faints, vomits one morning. Doctor orders a blood test. Days later, Ivis calls me at work with the good news. I in a daze. Her mother in Miami sure that her long distance novenas had worked, if late. God's miracle? Or was it vagrant chance that made the play? Either way, faith is deep water that wears away the rocks of reason, washes out silt of creed. Unstable, profligate, resistant to doubt's gravity. Um, 
This next poem is about my adopted daughter, Valerie. Who, um, it's a sonnet who has extreme ADHD. She, she had extreme ADHD in school, but uh, you know, now, I mean, this poem is about her when she was four. And we would go to the grotto to, to pray. And um, it's called Pix, Grotto of Our Lady of Lourdes, Notre Dame, Indiana. Rot cross, wounds of rust, ice welted saints. A rosary that thaws in a bronze bowl, picks of pleas. Valerie, giggling, snags it, a new necklace. Crows call, flap low, silty, clouds, specks of rain. She runs into the grotto, afraid of loud birds, thunder too, but will do handstands, cartwheels in a snowstorm. Beware to forget her pill. She'll eat pencils, cut clothes, blue lips, staple ears at school. We feed the money box. Light candles, kneel in the spring air. Mother of God, help me not break things. Be good, not litter, she prays, her crossing astray. I correct cold hands, but she twists in my arms darts toward the lakeside park. Afraid she'll get hit by a car, I chase skies now dark and scold. She cries, kicks, but piggyback can console. She plucks her bees. I drop a rung flea in the bowl. This next poem is also about my daughter, and it's called Adderall. I don't know how many of you know about Adderall. It's an amphetamine. It's a very strong medicine to um, medicate the condition. And, and uh, I mean, she had to take it at a very early age. And you'd be surprised at how young children uh, can be to take this kind of medication to, uh, um, to control the condition. Okay. Adderall. Each morning she takes the capsule, plump, buoyant like a pod in gastric swell, 